Hey, for the Wall Street Journal, this is Jim Fusilli, and I'm here with some of my colleagues to talk about what went on in the year that just passed. Um, Chris Farley, editorial director of WSJ Blogs, Karina da Fonseca of Aldheim, who's uh, one of our classical critics, and Mark Myers, who covers jazz for us. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So, Karina, uh, 2011, a good year in classical music? Well, it was a bad year for some of the big organizations. You know, City Opera was made homeless. The Philadelphia Orchestra declared bankruptcy. Um, but I think it was a good year for a lot of the smaller venues. I think a lot of great music was found in maybe more surprising places. Um, I think maybe one of the things that was new this year is that quite possibly we all went to see different artists in some of the same venues, like Poisson Rouge in the village or Galapagos Arts Base in Brooklyn. Uh, Joe's Pub, all of these places now have jazz, they have rock, they have classical music, and a lot of it is really high levels. Mark, how about you? In the future, when you look back at 2011, will, you, will your instinct be good year, bad year? I think it's a transition year, uh, Jim. I think uh, jazz is suffering uh, in some ways from its static format. I think as more and more pop and rock acts become uh, sort of this Cirque du Soleil hybrid, that uh, the appeal of going to see five musicians stand on a stage motionless for two hours is, is becoming less and less attractive. And more and more artists, I think, are embracing technology. I mean, you, you see like Robert Glasper, more sampling, more involvement of the computer. Um, so it's, it's becoming more exciting and it's being leveraged or mounted on top of other forms in a very interesting way. And do people, um, do we still use the expression jazz purist? Is that still a... Yes, used to be known as acoustic jazz or, right, right. or, or uh, club jazz. Uh, yeah, I think it's still quite a valid form. It's just that it's becoming increasingly difficult to earn a living based on the venues that these musicians are filling, which in general, if you're not a marquee name, if you're not a Jimmy Heath, Sonny Rollins, Benny Golson, uh, you're likely playing smaller venues with fewer and fewer people there. And of course, you know, with the nightclubs and the union issue in New York, um, these clubs are going to be increasingly uh, under pressure to charge more to um, pay union pension funds. Mm. Now, Chris, you pay careful attention to pop, I've noticed, and you have a keen appreciation of it. Um, a good year for pop? Yeah, I think every year is a good year for pop. I think you can always find something that's worth listening to uh, that's going to appeal to you, that's going to start a trend of some sort. I mean, it's just a matter of digging deeply enough and not just sort of just settling for what's at the top of the radio station playlists, whether it's something like the Civil Wars and Barton Hollow, or something much more mainstream like the Foo Fighters and Wasting Light. Uh, but that said, there were a lot of things that went on this year that, that were bad. You know, people that we lost, you know, like Amy Winehouse passing away, I think that cast a shadow over uh, the year. Uh, uh, like Adele uh, losing her voice and having to you know, undergo surgery and we're still waiting to see her recovery from that to, and we hope she'll make a full recovery S and of course Clarence Clemens the great saxophonist for the E Street Band passing away this year too so we lost all of them and, and there were some trends that I didn't like too for example the whole anniversary trend it seemed like more and more artists were celebrating anniversaries of their albums the Nirvana anniversary the um, uh, the anniversary for Pearl Jam uh, it, it was just too many anniversaries for these albums. U2 celebrated an anniversary for um, one of their albums. And uh, I think that, you know, although we do a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame museum, I think that it's, it's still too soon to put a lot of this music into a museum and let it see, get all dusty and just stand and stare at it like it's a, something stuck on a wall. It should be more vital than that. And all the anniversaries, I think, tended to take away from the, the, the vitality of some of the music that we listen to. So we're spending too much time looking backwards than looking around us right now. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Now, Karina, what are some of the albums that really struck you this year that represented the best of classical music in 2011? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm always looking for the contemporary music that really excites me and that I feel speaks for me and not just to me. And um, two of my favorite albums of the year of, of music written just very recently. Um, one of them is Gregory Spears' Requiem, which came out very recently, which is this deeply moving piece of music scored for this strange mixture of early music specialist singers, the two wonderful ensembles, um, Anonymous Four and Lionheart, who are normally early music specialists. Um, and then there's Troubadour Harp in the orchestration and viola. And he mixes the text of the, the mass of the Requiem 
with Breton folk traditions, um, I think fairy tales actually. And there's something about that mixture of sort of ancestral uh, familiarity and something unmistakably modern in there as well that really moved me and that I thought was very beautiful. Uh, any other albums we should take note of? Um, I also really like Jefferson Friedman's string quartets uh, performed by the Chiara Quartet. Uh, numbers two and three, they have gorgeous, luscious slow movements, um, but then also this sort of obsessive, driving, fast stuff which the Chiara really goes to town with. Um, that, that I thought was really exciting as, as you know, a modern composer taking on the string quartet with nothing else. Um, and then in the more traditional format, I really liked uh, Joyce Di Donato's Diva Diva, which is a lovely uh, kind of tribute to the mezzo-soprano's role at being able to play both trouser roles and skirt roles. Um, and she's just a singer who casts a very full shadow, and I think it really comes through on that album. Now, what does, and, and I'm, I'm posing on, uh, you have to represent the entire classical world now in, in answering this question, but what, an album like Chamber Music uh, with uh, Vincent uh, Seagal and mm -hmm. uh, Balaki Sissiko, which is a sort of hybrid of, of, uh, of cello music and Mali Kora music, uh, where does that, that sit in, in, in the classical universe? Well, I don't know where it sits in the classical universe, but for somebody who cares about classical music, and its roots, you're always interested in seeing how far they reach. And I think that Western music's roots reach way south of the Mediterranean. And um, there's a lot of collaborations that are often dubbed world music rather than classical that really bring out those, those common roots that we have. I mean, that album that you mentioned is, is very beautiful, although Vincent Segal is really not a classical cellist. He's a rock cellist. Mark, what about you? Um, Favorite albums, good albums, great albums? Yeah, interesting, Jim. In, in, the, in a year of box mania, I mean, jazz has really seen an exp I guess pop and rock really have too. That box, this was the year of the box set, I think. Um, it was interesting to see that some of the uh, best uh, albums this year were individual single albums. Um, my favorite album, and the way I sort of decide this is which one did I listen to more than any other rather than which one's most important. Um, but the Deep Blue Organ Trio's uh, Wonderful, which was a tribute to Stevie Wonder, was really the first time that um, a group has sort of taken Stevie Wonder's music and adapted it appropriately. And they've given it this 70s prestige records uh, funk jazz feel that just turns much of Stevie's well-known and not so well-known catalog into foot, tap, foot tappers. They're real, it's a really great album. Right. Now you liked one of the Sonny Rollins albums too, I, I believe. Volume two, uh, Rocha's is just absolutely startling. Um, it, it's, you, from the moment you put it on, it's as if you've flipped open a tiger cage and Sonny's just leapt out on top of you. I mean, it's just amazing the amount of stamina and uh, energy uh, that Sonny still has. And the creative force that he is is uh, extraordinary. On that album, you've got uh, two um, of the six tracks. You've got two from Japan in 2010, and the rest were from the famous September 10th, uh, 2010 uh, concert at Beacon <coughs> Theater. <laughs> now, Chris, what about you? I mean, uh, is, is, is pop so familiar to us that it's hard to surprise us with, with, with an album? Well, you know, I don't think so. I think there's a lot of great stuff. It's all over the map this year. Uh, I think that um, The Strokes, a very familiar band to almost every rock critic, they released an album that I thought was terrific called Angles. I like to see these bands keep together, keep working on new stuff, try to find new directions while working on old directions and trying to hone those. I think The Strokes have done that. They're a weird band because, you know, at one point they were critical darling, but they sometimes get beaten up by the critics too. It, it's hard to see what their place is in, in the sort of uh, rock and roll universe, but all I know is that they're making music that's worth listening to, and I, I hope they continue in, in that tradition. Um, I think that uh, Shelby Lynn, a terrific kind of alternative country singer-songwriter, I think she had, had an album that's very personal called Revelation Road. Come and rest your soul Let me be your good book Stories all been told And I'll hold you here you listen to um, country radio these days, you hear a lot of process stuff, a lot of empty stuff, a lot of vocals that seem maybe that, that they've been auto-tuned. It's nice to hear someone like Shelby Lynn do stuff that I think is very personal, very direct, and very real. Um, I, I think another album that really stands out to me is Rihanna's Talk That Talk. Yes, she's pure pop. 
Um, she does have some Caribbean influences. You hear some dance hall, some reggae in there, um, even some hip hop with Jay Z guesting on this album. She's been releasing a lot of records lately, about six albums in the last seven years. But I think this is really a strong record for anyone who likes to dance, who wants to hear some rhythmic um, variety, some rhythmic music, you know, talk their talks, an album that delivers on its promise. And Adele, I mean, you can't talk about this year's music without talking about Adele. I think her new album, 21, really confirms her status. It's not just a prodigy, but someone who really is um, mastering, you know, pop music. She's not only, is a, a, I think, a, a solid songwriter, she's great taste in terms of what she wants to cover, whether it's Bob Dylan or The Cure, um, but she also is, is, a, is a great, um, a, a, I think, a terrific vocalist, too, who doesn't overdo it. She knows she has a great instrument, she knows how to use it, and she doesn't go all over the map showing us her vocal power. She focuses it and makes her music worth listening to and not like a chore to slog through. The scars of your love, they leave me breathless. I can't help feeling we could have had it all. Rolling in the deep, you had my heart inside of your hands. And you played it to the beach. Adele came into the Wall Street Journal. I mean, uh, what do you think of Adele, Jim? I mean, what, what do you think he's added to sort of the pop music universe? Well, I, I, I think rock and pop is is really diffuse nowadays. It, it doesn't really fit into any sort of real um, easy slotting. I saw a Radiohead show this year where the only thing I could compare it to was Miles' Jack Johnson period. I mean, mm. it was just all modal music, mm. total improvisation, total communication. It didn't adhere to a pop or rock format at all. I think pop artists have a tendency to be dismissed, but as Adele's appearance at the WSJ Cafe proves, she's a, a singer of the highest caliber. I mean, she's got extraordinary uh, abilities as a vocalist, and she chooses pop as her métier. She can sing anything. She can be a jazz artist if she want, wanted to. I, I think what I found most fascinating about 2011 is the um, the pure musicality that we're seeing now across the board. I mean, players can really play now. Uh, singers can sing, writers can write, composers can compose, and arrangers can arrange. So if you come across an album like M83's Hurry Up, We're Dreaming, it's an excellent concept. I'm going to fuse big uh, 80s pop with contemporary dance music. You know, in the past, that would be an idea that would be executed at some level, but the idea would trump the execution. This album is so textured and so deep and so musical um, because he has mastery of craft and it's just not mastery of the studio. You know, he has mastery of his instrument, which is a keyboard. He also plays guitar. Um, and you, you see this across the board. I mean, what, I, I'd never heard of Anna Calvi. She came in here and met with us and we talked a little bit and she played her music and her music is huge. It's, it's as influenced by Edith Piaf as it is by any rock artist. And incidentally, almost, uh, she plays all the instruments. She's a great guitar player, great mm. bassist. You see this sort of uh, musicality, and I, Karina, you, you, you touched on it in passing earlier. Now you have these venues that, they're not rock venues, they're not classical venues. They, they take both in. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember seeing a show earlier this year with uh, Thomas Bartlett. Do you know him? He, he, he plays under the name Dove Man. Mm -hmm. Um, and Owen Pallett, who mm -hmm. plays under the name Final Fantasy, they had a string quartet on stage. And they moved very easily from pop and rock to classical music without even a breath. They, they mm -hmm. didn't indicate that these were two different things for them. Mm -hmm. They just saw it as all one kind yeah. of... And I think for music. a lot of classical players, um, you know, they, they grew up listening to rock. I mean, they don't have Beethoven on their iPods, you know. 
Um, it's, it's very much part of their DNA. And they too are totally familiar with all the technology that's out there. A lot of them record themselves, play around with composing software, with sampling things, with playing against themselves. And, um, and they're more than eager to collaborate across genre boundaries. Yeah. You mentioned Robert Glasper before. Yeah. I mean, um, his, his fusion is so thorough that you wouldn't call it jazz with hip hop. You wouldn't call it right. hip hop with jazz. It's sure. just Robert Glasper music. Right. It's, a, it's, a, it's the evolution of jazz into another form because everything else has sort of been exhausted, which I think really is what pop and rock are going through as well. The musicianship is higher, but so much of the idiom has already been exhausted that there's this merging and mixing because they're not just listening to their own genres. Rock, rock musicians are no longer listening to just rock, and pop isn't just listening to pop, and jazz isn't just listening to jazz. They're listening to anything that's dynamic and exciting because they speak a much higher language today musically. Okay. So there you have it, 2011, exciting year. Um, we all seem pretty satisfied, but I would say, wouldn't we? We? Absolutely. we want more. We want more. We want more and better for next year. You, we'll all investigate these albums that we've heard all about, and um, we'll check back in uh, periodically to see if we are uh, continuing along the high standard we set in 2011. He is Chris Farley. She is Karina Di Fonseca Walheim. He is Mark Myers. For the Wall Street Journal, I'm Jim Fusilli. <laughs>